Hi, I'm Kate Elliott, and this is season two of Narrative Worlds. We're into the new new year of 2022, which to me is the year that came after 2019. Um, thank you for coming today. The goal of this series is to dig into the idea of narrative worlds and the theory and practice of building them. Each month, a guest joins me for a dialogue on a specific aspect of world building or actually wherever our conversation takes us, which could really be anywhere. We'll talk for about 40 minutes and there'll be space for questions at the end. I'll close the hour by mentioning um, forthcoming guests. There's an ask a question button at the bottom. That's where I would prefer you put your questions. I can't keep track of the chat um, going on, but our tech wonderful tech person, CJ, will be able to monitor that for us. And again, I always say this, this is not a goal. It is not a lesson. It's a discussion by two professionals about their experience. There's no right answer. There's no secret handshake. If you hear something useful to you, fantastic. And if you don't, that's cool too. So let me today introduce today's fabulous guest, my Longtime friend, sorry, I have to do this. Michelle Cigara also, <laughs> also writes as Michelle West. How long have we known each other? I can't even, I like my memory doesn't go back that long. When was Into the Dark? 86, maybe? 80, uh, no, no, wait, sorry, you're right, right. 91. But 91. that was like, no, I think I first met you in like 86 or 87. Well, because okay. it, there was a long gap between uh, when I first finished Into the Dark. Well, I didn't finish Into the Darklands first. I finished Children of the Blood first. And then it went to the editor who bounced it back. And then I talked to the editor. And then it, I, I revised the book. Although, and this is because it's dinosaur age. She said, I cannot, I'm not offering you a contract. I'm not certain that I can offer you a contract. I can't ask you to revise for nothing. This is not what happens in modern publishing nearly as much, but she really truly felt that she could talk about things, but she could ask for nothing. I could take whatever I wanted out of it. So I went and I revised it. Uh, and then I sent it back in and she said, okay. And she sent it to Lester Del Rey and he sent a four page screed of rage. With really? little bits I of good heard things. this part. Hmm? And when, what was he, what was his issue? Uh, his issue was mostly that I had a 84 page flashback uh, in the last 20% of the book and it absolutely enraged him because that should have been, God damn it, but with a little bit more swearing, uh, not mine, his, that that should have been book one. Boom, boom, boom. He was, everybody was kind of saying, Lester can be a little bit harsh in his, in his critiques. Lester can be a little bit harsh. So now I was expecting that he was going to turn the book to ash, but mostly that was the big point of his letter. And I thought, oh, I could do that, <laughs> right? So then, and it took me three months. It was probably the fastest book I'd ever written. I just started from the beginning and wrote all the way through to the tragedy of the end. And then I sent that in and he liked that. <laughs> That's an amazing story about a, like, it feels like worlds away. Wow. It was a long time ago. And it was I, a long I, time ago. And since yeah. then you have written the, you wrote that quadology, you wrote the Hunter's books, you wrote the Sun Sword books, the House War books, uh, yes, and the, House the War Cast series. series, which now yeah, has and a the two seven spin books. off. Yeah, and the two Severn books. Yeah. Um, I have to get all the ducks in a row for the people who need to be able to go out and find out. So anyway, anyway, when I asked you if you would be on this, because I knew you and I could talk. I knew you and I could talk for an hour. If no, I, I want people to ask questions. I'm hoping people will ask questions, um, because the questions are always ones I wouldn't have come up with, which is why I love questions, right? But I also knew that were there to be no questions, we could easily fill the time. So you said, I said, well, I want to do something about world building, and you said, oh, I hate world building. I, I had to actually go back and explain this because people actually said but you have a very complicated world building. I said, yes, <laughs> I mean, I have a relatively clean kitchen too. I am not getting up and saying, yay, I get to clean the kitchen. I don't mind doing laundry. So I guess you could look at laundry as one of those intermediate 
it asks for writing. But the world building part for me is always difficult uh, because I start in I start in different places than you do, right? I don't start with the geology. I don't look at the geography. I start with city. With I have a rough sense of geography, rough sense of weather, rough sense of the bits and pieces. But I actually focus in on the organizations, the structures, and the people. Then, say I start writing the, about the ten, like the ten families. Um, as a background, and the Twin Kings, and how the Twin Kings came to be, and I kind of created them so that the, the world could have kind of stable rulership, so that I could then say, okay, we're going to have a stable ruling class and stable laws, or a stable sense of how um, the rule of the kingdom is preserved. We have two Gladborn kings, that's fine, and that's fine, but then as I'm coming up with the characters, so for the 10, the various people that form the House Councils, which that's a lot of names. But then I start doing the, okay, but this person came to the house because of this, and this person came to the house because of this, and this, and then I don't want to keep, I don't want to start with the second of the 10 houses. Like I, I want to actually work with the characters that I'm, that are already starting to make noise. It's like, okay, there's this, and there's this, and so I have to sit on it and continue to add the things that I might have to reach for later. And I will say that I sometimes have that kind of false start. I think, I'm ready now. Yay, I get to write the book. And then I, you know, start the book six times because I'm trying to find the way in. And then I get, you know, midway through chapter one and there's the Artisan's Guild. Like, what the hell is that? Okay, then I need to actually come up with names because, of course, uh, many of the characters have this information already. This is stuff that they know. If I'm making up everything on the fly, it doesn't actually, to me, it doesn't have the, the roots or the grounding in the way the character expresses the information, in the way characters respond to the information when I'm writing them. So the on the page characters, um, I have to sort of know what they know. You're making, you're making, no, 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 I'm, no, I'm thinking about, uh, this is actually really interesting to me because, um, I mean, obviously I do a mix. Some things I have to know in advance. Some the things, only person in the universe I know who used campaign cartographer for fun. Sorry. Go well, ahead. Th that, that was a short <laughs> phase of my life, <laughs> but, but I would still be, yeah, that was kind of, that's a cool program. Um, yeah. but, it, God, that feels like it's a, long a time user ago. hostile program, Alice. It, it is. That's why I stopped <laughs> using it. Um, cause it wasn't fun, but, but you once talked about how you write and that you will write a paragraph. And if you, I may, I'm going to be mischaracterizing this. So please okay. feel free to correct me that you will like write a paragraph, but it has to have the right flow. So then you have to go back and like pro if like not use that paragraph. It has to have the right flow. And what I'm hearing is it's like, kind of, there's a similar process with the world building for you that you have to, it has to be embedded in the characters in the right way, or you can't keep going forward. I don't consciously have the, the paragraph has to have the right flow. Um, I discovered this because an editor of mine, well, actually now it's three editors, uh, said I was just a pain in the butt to line at it. And I said, why? You know, I, she said, okay, <laughs> this is my big example. This is a thing that drove it home. She said, I want you to make these two, this, this semi-clause, the semicolon clause, two separate sentences. He said, just change a semicolon. She said, I want you to do it. I said, fine, whatever. So I went in because I'm not wed to it, right? And I changed the semicolon to a period. And then I kept going in four paragraphs down. I, the end of the fourth paragraph down required the structure of that bloody sentence. Now, who does this to themselves? Who, who does this? The answer clearly was me. So I had to rewrite all four paragraphs because I had, I had changed that one thing, which I had just told her to change. It's like, you know, go ahead. So there is a flow to the words on the page. And there, if you're, hmm, 
Writers sometimes talk about flow, about finding the flow of a book, about, you know, finding, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I will say, the voice of the book or the tone of the book. Right. But right. it's because for me, uh, the words are the book. There are some writers, no name mentioned who will do multiple iterative drafts and i remember cold magic i don't remember the first chapter that you sent me which i think was the first chapter you'd written mm -hmm. um and i remember the published book yeah. and i think you had three sentences in common between yeah. the, that first version and the published book and for yeah. me i have a much larger number of sentences in common because I'm not very visual. I'm probably aphantasic. So the words are the book to me. You Does that mean you don't visualize? No. You don't see things? See, no. now this is so interesting to me in terms of world building. Because I see, I probably don't see in full technicolor, but I see visually if I'm going through a space. I imagine it in my mind. And then I have to describe, you know, they walked through the door and there was a lintel and like in my, see, I even look up, I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. That's how I, that's how I process things in that physical sense. So this is really fascinating to me that, especially when you talk about it being grounded, the artisan's guild, it has to be, it's grounded in what your characters know. And you have to know what your characters know and how yes. they feel about it. Right. Right. So, I have had so many people say, oh, but you can't be a fantastic because I get such good visuals from your books or you can't do that because you're a writer. It's like, it's not like I'm blind, but I tend to form memories, not around the visual, but around how something strikes me, how it makes me feel. I used to have, and I still do sometimes, you create words that encapsulates something visual that you're watching that moves you. So it's, for me, anchored in some ways in the response, the internal response, because mm -hmm. I'm not gonna walk away from this and then think that is a beautiful starry sky. But when I'm writing, what I'm reaching for is not the visual, it's the response. Does it make any sense? It absolutely makes sense. And another reason for me to do this is because I love this. I love hearing <laughs> from people because everybody brings something so different to how they write. And it also, to me, matters for people listening because they don't aren't hearing like there's one way we do this. A lot of people are visual writers like me, right? Like we see it like it's on a movie screen to some extent, not full. Tanya, Tanya. Yeah, Tanya yeah, Huff. Tanya Huff, yeah. Yeah, like, but it isn't the work. only way to work. So I want to come back. I mean, what is world building to you? If, if it's what people know and, and how what they think about it and how they feel about it, what is world building at world all? World building is, in fact, that. Uh, but, but sideways, not quite the way that you do it. Hold on two seconds. I just want to add here while Michelle's off getting either more coffee or whatever was. No, she's no, doing. I was it just matter. It's okay. It's okay. Stuff. No, that that there isn't. I mean, that's the whole point of world building is that there isn't one right way. There isn't one. There is no single right way to do anything in writing. I mean, that's that's the big thing. That's why I almost hate to give advice because I know that there are younger writers and they and and they make this connection. I love Michelle's books. And this is what works for Michelle, so I will do this too. But it's a disconnect between those two things. And yeah. everybody, yeah. no matter what they love, processes things different. I remember thinking that you and I probably had very similar writing processes because we looked at so many structural things yes. in a very similar way. Yes, that's right. Because structurally, we both right. deal with plot as architecture, story as architecture. It has to be that. See, that's the one thing. So I change my words a lot. Like I will like go through six drafts of a first chapter and it will look completely different. But, the, totally architecture did. <laughs> my, but the architecture of my book is conceptualized usually before I start writing or very early in the process. Mm -hmm. And I can never escape that architecture. I can't alter it. I can't say, oh, I'm going to throw this out now because that would be more convenient. I, that to me, the architecture is like, bam, it's set in place. And the whole book functions on that architecture for me. 
The okay, words it's, can shift, but it's a different process. Yeah, so that no, may it's a different be, process, but it's sort of the same. So it's like for me, hmm, I am writing to an ending. That ending has strong emotional resonance for me. And the book, you know, sometimes there are perfect bells. You hit them, they ring, and there's a moment yeah. afterwards where the where the sound is louder than it was yeah, yeah. on first impact. Yeah. So the book is that sound. I love I love this metaphor so much. So I don't it doesn't change. Like if someone said, well, we really hate this yeah. ending. Yeah. Um, and can't you make these two fall in love immediately and get married? It's like, no, because no. <laughs> I mean, maybe if I threw out the entire book and had totally different characters, but the characters are kind of wed structurally, emotionally yeah. to the ending. Yeah. And so in that sense, we're very much alike. I don't yes, absolutely. Yeah. I don't consider it architecture because it's about people, but in fact, in some ways it is. It's just, it's a, it's a much more interior architecture because that's the way that I remember the world. And it's, in, it, it's interesting because w when I think of what is needed to create that, that resonance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you, you, one of the subtitle of our, of our, sub, our topic today is I hate world building, but I have to do it anyway. Why are there no shortcuts? And for me, if you can't get that resonance, if you don't have, if, if you haven't built it, right. Cause you're building the point where that tone gets hit in that way to create that resonance. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. No, it makes perfect sense yeah. to me. Yeah. To, to us, it makes sense. It will. But that's also why someone will say, well, why is this scene necessary? I said, look, it, it's not, but I can answer. I'm a cancer up to a point. But if you are attacking something fundamental or that I feel is emotionally fundamentally structural, then actually I'll start to answer. I don't like to do it. I don't like to do it because it introduces that type A intellectual response and books for me do not work out well when I'm trying to be type A and in control. I just, they just do not work. I, I lose the ability to hear them over the ability to, um, for the ability to dissect. They're two very different frames of mind. When I'm, when I'm world building, I can be entirely intellectual. And in fact, when I went back to look at my old notes, many things had changed. Some from, names have changed. From the very beginning? Yes, from, yeah. from before Hunter's death. I'd written this whole thing about the empire and you know general commerce notes and the various guilds, the ones that had power, the 10, the non-10 houses that had power, the merchant's guild, um, which has power. Because I needed to, if I was going to be dealing with people in power. So Jewel is easy, right? at least to start later on, she's also difficult, but she's easy to start because she knows very little. She yes. doesn't understand the economy and she understands that they're gonna starve if they don't somehow figure out some way to make money. And if that involves stealing, it's better that they steal things and die, which not everyone would agree with, but that viewpoint, but that viewpoint also knows the life that she's lived, right? So yeah. it's, a, it's much more of a microcosm. It's just, when she starts meeting people who actually have power, political power or otherwise, I have to have some understanding of what those people want, who they are, how do they rule, how do they govern, how do they lead? So you have the Calicar, the Brilia, they're very different leadership styles, but those are all elements of how, of how that character will interact with the characters who move the plot or become the characters who move the plot, depending. Yeah, I, I've, I've had this discussion in different ways with other people about how a lot, so much of world building is not really like that physical tree that's over there or that mountain that's over there. No. But, but it's the relationships between people and what, how people, how people relate to each other and to mm -hmm. the institutions and the setting that they're in because that's how we are. I mean, that's what most, that's what human society is, yep. you know. It's that, so, plus also 
it makes it much, much easier if, I mean, if you're only going to do um, brief things, you have to know what people want. What do they want? Once, if you know what somebody wants, you can put them into almost any context and the tools that they have at hand are that context, that hierarchical right. place. What are they trying to reach for? But so much of the world building for me, again, uh, tends to be around people. So even when I started Merchant Guild stuff, in the end, it's people. It's what they want. It's who who is ruling now. Uh, it's who people are afraid of, who they respect, who they think they can walk all over, much to their unfortunate sorrow. It it's it's those elements. It's almost less about what they're trading. Well, except for two people. Um, and I think that that actually is necessary if you want to have, no, let me try that again. It's necessary if I want to have characters that while I'm writing them, I believe in. Yeah, yeah. I, you think I that's often... why it's very hard for you, for any of us to just be, to just write a random book. It's like, well, this well, is selling really well. Do this one. The thing <laughs> is, when you write that random book, people say, well, I, anytime a person might say, well, I don't do much world building. They're actually doing a lot of world building. They're just not doing it deliberately. They're doing it by borrowing and pulling in. It's why we have fantasy novels where everyone acts like they're in the 1950s middle-class American suburb or, you know, or whatever, right? Because they're just pulling in things that aren't, they're pulling in the world building they live in without thinking about how appropriate it would be or even if they want it to be, deliberately want it to be the way that they want their world to work. I remember talking to you after, Hunt, after you read Hunter's Death. You asked me a question about Twin, Twin Kings and about the decisions I'd made in world building. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I was trying to do something more modern. <laughs> and then you laughed in my face. And I said, no, 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 not that, not that. I was trying to create a world in which a modern concept of good and evil yeah. would hold. So the modern for me was that sense, good, evil. And what I was trying to do was create a world in which our concept of good and bad could overlap with their concept of good and bad. But I did have to create uh, the structural supports for that. Dominion doesn't have the Dominion. It wasn't necessary for me to do it. So I did not do that. Yeah, that's right. And culturally, it's very different. And the people are very different. Um, but the, the people in the Dominion, and this is the Sun Sword, the Sun, yes, it Sun is. Sword series, they live in a very dense and fully imagined world that I can imagine walking through. I understand. Uh, and it's interesting because I am more physically oriented than you are. Like, I want to see the buildings mm -hmm. and I want to see the, the trees and the rivers and whatever. But I can... So I may not always see those specific things in your work, but I always know where I am with the people, right? I always know how it would be for me in whichever role I was able to take as reader or as a person, how I would be able to move through that culture because it's so densely imagined and it's so grounded. That's how, when your work does that. Oh, um, that's character though, I think. Yeah, no, no, it's exactly. It's because I know where the characters stand in relationship to each other. Which, as you is, you know, I mean, to me is kind of the crux of it. It is the crux of it for me. Um, but when I tend to admire real world building effort, there's a lot more. Like I think that there are a lot of things that you can you you personally consider when you are building a world. And I will think. Oh, well, there you, are. Hmm? Yes, there are. Yeah, and, and there are things that I think uh, is this sustainable sure next because they're not the things that concern me i thought once that maybe what i should do is write a fantasy about bankers right because then because you could make if you had magic or things like that you could make there would be some tension in it um but i think daniel abrams did it so that yeah i was just about to say daniel that. abram did that i'll let him i i can't even watch tv shows about bankers you know i found i found the novel mm -hmm. I wrote when I was 17. Hold on. I'm going to read you the first sentence because this is so funny. <laughs> I 
I typed this novel on a typewriter, an old typewriter when I was 17 over the summer. Well, and anyway. we lost your picture. Oh, so, oh no, shit. <laughs> it doesn't want me. It doesn't want me to show. What the heck, dude? Oh, start my video. There I am, I'm back again. <laughs> Somebody's telling my 17 year old self is saying, no, don't do it. Anyway, so here it is. That's weird. Why is it quitting? Oh, that's him. Okay, is it back? Are you back, Logitech camera? You are back. I'm anyway, take, here looking. it is. Yes. But, so remember, for those of you who may not know, um, I grew up in rural Oregon in farm country. This is the opening sentence. The harvest was one month gone. That's the opening sentence. The first thing I'm concerned about is the agricultural cycle. I find that really, I find that both really funny and also really charming because all of my books, I have to deal with agriculture and, it, and I, it's because I grew up embedded in it and it was all around me. Yeah, but I also think it's important when you're working in a family, like, I mean, how are you feeding people? Well, well no, it is also people. important for those other reasons, but people will write whole fantasy sequences where the issue of food and where it comes from isn't that important to the plot or even to the characters. It's just something that's delivered. Um, and, and that's neither here nor there. But I think, I, think, I think to get back to what I think I heard you saying is that we each bring like these focuses that we, mm -hmm. that we want to bring out in our books. And that's what makes our books each unique, right? We're not right. all writing from the same template. You're not already, we're not all writing from the same place, but we are all writing as people who were readers and were, who moved, were moved by reading. We're going to respond to different things in it. And, but sometimes I, I, I suppose in that particular way, you admire people who are doing things that you're not doing. Exactly. And then on bad days, you wonder yeah. why you're bothering because they're just so much more competent. <laughs> You know, people sometimes ask that question, you know, what, what book do you wish you'd written? And I'm like, I don't know, the one, the one, my next project that I haven't finished yet, that's the book I wish I had written, because then it would be done. And I wouldn't have to write it. But I don't want to write other people's books. I want them to write them. Because I can't write those books. They don't come from my center or my whatever, my core. Um, I love what other people read precisely for that, for what other people write precisely for that reason, right? I like because it they're... because I didn't have to write it, so I do not know, I don't see everything and think, how many people read this and let that sentence go through? You know, I like just, and there's always a moving target, right? You pick up something from 1991, you start it, you think, nope, <laughs> and you put it down and you never want to see it again. And it doesn't mean that it's terrible. It just means that what you think of as good writing now and what you thought of as good writing in 1991 are kind of separate. Yeah, but I mean, that's a, that, that's a whole, that's also an issue of what for, for, for me gets into this idea of the importance of creativity as a lifelong journey that we can, because, you know, you and I have had this opportunity to write for many years, 30 years, right, and publish and continue publishing and see ourselves, see ourselves change and, you know, hopefully improve. I like to think I'm a better writer than I was in you know, 1988. Um, and I think that's such a, I think that's such an interesting aspect in terms of getting I mean with craft is like what things are we still carrying from those early days are we still doing in the same way and what things have we changed our process you know do you feel like you still are world building pretty much the same well you know your world's really well right now you've been working in those two worlds for quite a yeah, while past books always throw things in sideways Wrench. Wait, oh, so you, another wrench. Oh, great. Another wrench. And this book is due. So are you saying that you world build slightly differently with the two universes? I absolutely do. Oh, now tell me more. I want to hear about this because I think my Just process books. is pretty much the same with every book. No, as the West novels for me are because there are so many viewpoints and because there are battles and because there are wars and because I know what the end is. And because when I started right. at the beginning, I knew there were certain things I needed. Um, it, it, there was a lot more detail in it for me. 
and my sense of what I needed to know was larger, but, but those books were often considered very dense. They're very dense. They're very difficult to read. If you miss a sentence or two and then the wrong sentence or two, and you go on to the next paragraph, you have no idea what's going on. And I got a lot of that. Um, I still get that sometimes, right? People are just like, huh? Because they're not used to having to read all the words. Yeah. And at the time I didn't realize that, like, I mean, if I didn't mean for the words to be read, why would I write them? <laughs> so there's a lot of detail. It's a lot, very, a lot of density and they're long because of it. But I think that they were inaccessible to some readers because of it. So the cast series, I realized two things. The longer I take, the more complicated it gets. One. <laughs> two. Hi. <laughs> two. Um, and this was Sheila Gilbert actually said, Michelle, all of your short stories are so immediately accessible. They're much more relatable. They're, you don't have this, this, this density. How come? And I said, do you really want to know? And she said, yes. I said, because I say I'll write the story six months before it's due, thinking I have lots of time. And then in the week before it's due, I think, oh my God, oh my God, that story. And I sit down and write the whole damn thing in one go in a panic. And she said, pardon? I said, I don't have time to think. I just have time to panic. So I know where I'm going and I start it and head to that point. I don't have time to think about it. I don't have time to say, Oh, but maybe this wouldn't, oh, this would be interesting here. No, 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 it's, here's the starting line. That's the finish line, sprint. And she said, so what you're saying is you need to write faster. And it's like, <laughs> but I know it sounds terrible, right? But no, My no, I listen, listen, I'm feeling a lot of sympathy or even empathy with this, with this, this part of the discussion. Well, but she said that yeah. it, they were, all the shorts were a lot more, she didn't say relatable, she said accessible. Yeah. They didn't, they weren't as complicated and, and that's true, but when she asked why, I told her why, it's because I don't know, I, she said, so you're a big overthinker. And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be true of me. And sadly, almost every avenue of life. It's like overthinking, overthinking, overthinking. It's not helpful, but that's the way my brain works. So with the cast novels, I had a very rough, like I mean, two page. Okay, so there's this and there's this and there's this. And uh, the, there are these other races that will come into things and she's a cop. Next. <laughs> um, I had to actually go back and make things clearer to myself as she approached them. But the thing is, um, Caitlin is bad at budgeting. I mean, there's some one little bit where Severin is teaching her how to budget because she is always out of money and kind of, you know, just trying to point out, yeah, yeah, I know that you have to do this, but you have no money. So there's a whole bunch of things that she doesn't know and she doesn't think about. Um, she is very over-focused on her job. She is very good at putting certain things together about her job. But, you know, not pissing off the quartermaster was unfortunately not one of the things that she thought about. And now she knows because he's still pissed off. Um, I only needed to know when I started what she knew. Right. So I had a clearer idea of the fives, clearer idea of Ravalon, clearer idea of the towers because she grew up there. But I didn't need to know how everything else functioned. Because, because she you only know. needed to know it when she learned it. Uh, yeah, but she, but because of that, uh, we're learning it as she's learning it. So she brings her own viewpoint to things. Uh, Severin was much harder. Um, but by that point, I had a much clearer idea of things as I went. So you start this book and you think, okay, and now we're going to be doing what? All right. And then you go back and you fill in the world bits, but they don't actually con conflict with Kaylin because she doesn't know anything about them. And it's a single viewpoint. Right. And and with the Severn spin-offs, you already, like you said, as you said, you already know so much about the world because you've written so many books in it. Mm -hmm. That that gives you kind of like that bigger, stronger foundation, even if you're delving into places that you might not have ventured before. 
Well, <clears throat> I'm delving into places that I that I have ventured before. Like the first book, well, actually, no, it's the wolves, so maybe not. But the second book is in the West March. And the West March, Kaylin had two books in because <clears throat> Michelle is stupid. I knew that I could do a short, short, 150,000 word book. Because at the time that was still considered, you know, that was the longest they wanted, but they, that was acceptable. If I had one viewpoint, if I have two viewpoints, everything's off the table yeah. or everything was yeah. off the table. Yeah. And it wasn't until the Emperor's Wolves that I could handle multiple viewpoints in a shorter book. The, the, it's the first one, so was that book 30 something, 30 something? I finally figured out how to somehow write a story. Actually, I should knock wood when I say this, that has multiple viewpoints that is not 250,000 words. How? Can you please give me some advice? I need that. Uh, well, Okay, listen, I did this. I did the YA trilogy. They were all hundred. No, no, they're single point of view. Never mind. Single point Never of view mind. I could do. The yeah, reason I had to split yeah. Cast in Peril and Cast in Sorrow is uh, I'm stupid. And I forget that the minute Kaylin is going into a totally unknown environment, you really have two characters, <laughs> Kaylin and the environment. And, and then I did not have one book anymore. Yeah, yeah. And that was... Very painful. You know, and there's an interesting insight in there about this idea of not world building itself, the process, but the setting, the environment, the, the mm -hmm. society as itself a character. Because if we think of mm -hmm. characters as we ourselves are always interacting with other people, as you and I are right now, but there's always, yeah, so the environment in that sense can also be seen as another character. Yes, because she was going through the Hallion. I mean, she was she was seeing all of these brandy things she had never seen, and uh, and some of the Hallion are actually alive. They're not just buildings. So there's character interaction, but because she hasn't seen any of this before, and also she's wearing the stupid dress. It there there goes the book. I had to chop the first six chapters of Cast in Peril and toss them because I could not make. Um, I couldn't, I didn't have an, I didn't have enough space to even write an ending. So I did not get rid of them. And my editor really, my editor did not want to lose um, a chunk of that. But it's like, well, that's too bad. Either you talk them wow. into an extra 3,000 words or, <clears throat> or we're losing them. Gone. And she still, uh, years later, would mention things that happened in that first six chapter as if it was canonical, but it wasn't because none of that stuff happened. It all had to be excised. Actually, you're you of all the people I know, you are a person who throws out. I don't want to say throws out, who cuts stuff, excises. You throw out more words than I. And I'm like, oh, I've done some big cuts or or written, you know, forty thousand words and said, oh, this isn't working. I have to start over, but not often. And I do a lot of revising at the beginning. I like, oh, rewrite and rewrite words. and rewrite and rewrite. But I know, yeah. but the West novel, the West novel, 200,000, uh, 200,000. I know, just like words. my, my mind boggles. But it's because I can't make things work, right? So this is the pantsing and this is the organic. This is the reason that I, as a young, young new, eager writer at 15 years old, none of that's published, I would desperate, I would happily write those scenes that were really motivating me to write because I really wanted to and they, and they had such emotional strength to me on the inside of my head. But what I learned fairly quickly is if I start at the beginning and I start writing the characters and the situation, book doesn't go to that. The book is just not going to that scene. Book is not going to that scene. Book is going, it's growing in a totally different way. Thanks guys. And so even, um, I was desperately hoping to save one section of that 200,000 words, just one section. And my Australian alpha reader said, yeah, good luck with that, meaning no way. And when I finally got to the place where I thought I could use this section, I couldn't use any of it, any of it, because the voice and the tone, it's different. So I could so say, let me write this event, but it's got to be written again. You can just throw that whole thing out. Now for you, you, 
because you think more structurally, you have an event and this way it didn't work where it was and you can put it aside, right? It, I can, I can, I can bring it back. It might not be in the way I originally envisioned it. So in, in yes. uh, let's, to go back to cold, the cold magic books, I knew that in book two, cold fire, there was going to be a scene where Kat and Andavai are sitting on a bench and it was going to be very fraught. It was going to have a lot of resonance. This was what bell scene. This was a bell scene in the book. Right. right. And I had this whole scene imagined in my mind before I, as at the very beginning, as I was kind of working up to start cold fire, the book two, by the time I got to the place where that scene went, that whole thing, all that stuff was gone. The, the way that element of the plot had gone was totally gone from the story. But I right. still have a scene on the bench because I figured out how to do it. I figured out how to fold okay. it in to the new way I was doing it. Let me say one thing here. I yes. don't think I throw it any more than you do. I think the difference is that, well, as I said, you give me chapter one of Cold Magic. <laughs> And I do remember that because I said something and you said, oh, that's what Rhiannon said. <laughs> it's exactly <laughs> what you said. Okay, okay, I've done this. But, but again, in the end, I recognize that sentence and I recognize that sentence. That's the hardest thing for me about the, like alpha reading for you is I have to ignore all the words. Oh, and yeah, nobody and I, usually asks you to read yeah. things and ignore all the words, but you, that's how you have to read it. Yeah, yeah. You throw out way more than I do, I think, because like it, you'll, you do wholesale rewrites. You change I do wholesale all the words. rewrites completely. Yeah. Yes. Huge and rewrites. For me, for me, the same thing is throwing at 200,000 words and starting again. It's like if. Okay. It, it, it is, you, you're, yeah. you're actually yeah. throwing out all those words. No, you're right. You're I don't think of it, it as like that. I think of it as revising, but it is also. I mean, those it is throwing words, out all those I don't words. Even, and not, I don't even think about yeah. them. Once they're gone, I'm like, well, they're gone. This is better. Yeah, right. it's, for me, it's very much analogous in, in my process. Yeah, yeah. The, that 21,000 yeah. words toss because the book isn't going there because the, the voice or the tone or the flow of it has changed. It is altered. And there are big events that happen that are not happening, but there are small events that I'd love to keep that are also not happening. It just doesn't suit the flow of book. So books for me are like seeds. You plant them, they grow. But if you've accidentally planted, I don't know, a pine tree and you actually need an oak tree, you're going to have to actually remove the pine tree. If it can't go it. there, if it can't yeah, go, you can't there, go right. there, right, right, right. So I don't No, think you're right. I, you're right. I do. I do. Actually, I don't even think of it as throwing out, which is interesting because revision maybe because revision is treated as something different than first draft, but it isn't really. It's all part no, of the process. It's not for me. You're doing at least as much throwing things out. But the problem for me is... Uh, I can add bits and pieces. Sheila says, <clears throat> Gilliam doesn't seem upset enough that Stephen is dead. And I'm thinking, okay, I can add that. But I get to the book and I have a scene where he's reacting. And so then I think, all right, let me go beat my head against a wall for three weeks. Because clearly when she says he doesn't seem upset enough, um, that's not quite what she means. Like she, Her reaction is not Right. The reaction, it's not strong enough for her. And actually, this would be one bit of advice. If an editor says something is not working, they're, they're talking as a reader. And that frequently means something doesn't work. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the thing they're pointing at is the wrong thing. A lot of times, you don't have the structural support behind it. So when they get to this scene, it feels flat. But the scene itself would be fine if you'd if built it the was. structure. And that's a hard lesson to learn. That's a hard thing to learn. And I've seen people rewrite the same small scene over and over again, but it's never going to get any better because that's not the actual problem. So editor says there's a problem. There is a problem. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the scene they're pointing at as the problem is the thing that has to be changed. But yeah, that's <clears throat> um, something it took me a long time to learn, to read around this to read around and figure out, so what really is going on here? And what is it that I really need to fix to make this work? I want to yeah. say that if anyone wants to ask a question, please pop one into the Q&A. Because um, that's a, I mean, I will always say that the most important lesson I personally have learned, I don't, this may not be true for others, and it will depend on your process, is how to revise. Which maybe just means it was my means of how to throw out things and put new things in. <sighs> their place. And we each have our own way of doing that. 
some people do such heavy outlining at the beginning that they don't have to revise much once they, you know, it's like Mozart. She, he just writes the notes, right? And then they're pretty much correct as he puts them down because he's, it's all in his head before it goes down on the page. And I can't, I don't work like that. I, I have a messy, messy process. I hate revisions. I hate them. I hate them. I love drafting. But revisions, <clears throat> very often for me, um, if something is wrong and I realize it's wrong, that's when you get it to throw out like 600 pages. You, because it's a, it's a structural thing. It's a flow thing. This is wrong. Oh. I remember saying that to Veronica Chapman when she said something didn't work. And I said, as we're talking about it, I realized what the problem was. And I said, you realize this means I'm going to have to throw out the entire book and start it again. And she said, I think so, yes. <gasps> oh, no, no, it was fine. No, no, um, no, no, no. But, but yeah, that was nice. Because it was, that was nice of her to be honest. It was, it, but it was a, a subtle structural thing that wasn't working. And there was no way to fix that. My agent at the time wanted me to just kind of band-aid something across this or this, but once I'd seen what the, what the underpinning problem was, it would have absolutely killed me to have that book published the way it was. So I threw out the whole book and started the game because, and maybe that's, hmm, most people would not consider that revision if that makes any sense. But it I consider revision. that, I consider that revision. Right, it is revision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And actually, when I realize what's wrong, I don't care if I throw it 600 pages or 800 pages or whatever, because I, it's like, oh my God, you just, you realize it, you have that moment, and then you start again, but you start with more certainty. You start with, I don't know, more, not, not confidence, but you have a focus, you sort of have a plan, but you, you, you can feel. Like you, you feel more grounded. I, I just had that happen with um, the second Sun book. I wrote and rewrote and rewrote the opening 50,000 words like six times and it just wasn't working and I I knew that there was something a structural just I knew there was a little structural issue going on and I couldn't now. figure out what it was so I sent it to my editor um, and she read that opening and it was this was like you know a quarter of the book right or or less I don't mm -hmm. know but um and she said oh because the, the 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 events the plot physical events of it weren't the right they were the events but they weren't the the i don't know the the emotional that that spine that goes through that pulls you through right and she mm -hmm. said oh it's this and i'm like oh that's it right and then and that was it bam i had it and then it was yes exactly it it's was fine like no i saved a lot of the stuff I had written. Some of it, I, I, threw, out a, I threw out a lot of stuff. <laughs> and then I rewrote some of the stuff that I knew I needed because I knew I needed it. I just didn't see how it fit. And then I completely rearranged it for like the seventh time, right? With a bunch <laughs> of rewritten chapters in new order and new stuff put in mm -hmm. to set up that. And once that was set up, in, right. it's like in early on it's like in the first 50 pages this one moment once it's set up I just had it there the the spine went all the way through and, and it, it's the last thing I mean it's just yep. that was it see for me um my throwing away like if I throw away 30,000 words whatever um if I have to throw away 200,000 words because it, it but that's the frustrating part because it's almost right there are whole elements ab about it that are right. There are you as you're writing this, you understand that what you thought you were writing and what this is actually about are subtly different uh, or not so subtly different. Um, mm. And that means that this was wrong and this was wrong. So let's get rid of all of this and start here. Uh, no, actually, that's not working either. Um, it's just for me, it's beginnings. It's trying to find the way into the book. Yeah. Once I have it in general, I have it, but I was very stressed about length and about trying to finish this work in the smallest possible space and et cetera, et cetera. I will say that with the Sheila thing, after she said this one thing, it, three weeks later, I woke up in the morning and I thought, oh my God, you're an idiot, Michelle. And then I had the hunter ladies and these people are widowed, right? And they, they have lost people 
they have come to this place to escape the sacred hunt and the constant reminder of sacrifice and death. And here they are in the heart of the empire. And somebody's hunt brother has died in the sacred hunt. So they go. And it was that. That was the thing. Yeah, that was for the her. Thing it was the needed. contextualization again. It was coming back. And in world building, you had already set up. Yes, by the way. in the previous yeah. thing. But I it think was that... in that. It was already there. And sometimes it's the stuff that's already there. In the case of my, in the case of this this plot thing I had, it was already there. I mean, it was almost obvious if you weren't. <laughs> well, yeah, but if you're this close but, to the book, yeah, if you're this, if you weren't this close to it, yeah. um, and that's where solutions often are in something that's already there that's just been overlooked or not placed in the right place or not yes but i think that almost all of writing is like that the reason i have to throw away things is because of process and the reason that you can hold on to things is because your start of things is so mm, it's, it's very structural i need this and i need this and i need this so when you take you know 200 pages and put them aside there are structural elements in it that you might be able to repurpose yeah. later. But since yeah. I, since the way that I work, not visual, so not as architectural in a, an intellectual sense, is organic and it has to flow from one element to the other. If I, <laughs> I can think, this is a thing that explained what this has to be about and God damn it, and then throw the whole thing out. Because while I now have a very clear window into the one thing that I did not see clearly, there is no way to repurpose any of it. It is okay. Now I know this that I did not even consider. And let's start it again with that knowledge. Yeah. So in fact, I think that we do the same thing, um, but in different ways. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And, and world building is actually very much at the core of both of what we, of what we write. However, however, what, whether it functions as a character you know, yeah, I would say though that if I'm writing, or... if I'm writing contemporary, I don't worry. My sense of, I mean, how much do, do do average people understand about how politics actually work, how the economy actually works, how certain other things actually happen? Probably not very. They're they're going along with their lives. But I've only written. I have actually my first contemporary fantasy is coming out next year. As a, with the tour.com that my other my second novella is coming out next year I've never I don't think I've ever written a contemporary fantasy before um and most of mine were shorts yeah and and again it was it was kind of nice because I didn't have to explain there's stuff I didn't have to explain you, you know explain how cars work you don't have to explain how you don't have to explain what you mean by a road you, you know or a house you have to worry about bathrooms or sewage or you can just you say they went past that the bathroom. Bathroom knowledge yeah yeah exactly. you don't have to say how did they do this in this you know yep. pre whatever time of well you know how did they use the plumbing i used to go to i used to remember mm -hmm. being in i remember visiting crete and being so fascinated because there's all these plumbing this plumbing stuff built into these how many years three thousand three 3,000 year old places that I was just fascinating. I'm like, yes, my people. <laughs> yeah, it, but it, it is that kind of thing and you don't yeah. have to worry about any of it. Yeah. Right. You worry yeah. about, you worry about current concerns or relatable modern concerns. Well, because the, the reader, you, you're assuming the reader is coming in with expectations. With all of that. With all of that, which can be a problem, but and, and that's one reason I always feel like fantasy and science fiction are require a little more world building on the page because you want to make sure that their expectations aren't ones that go against what what you're setting up. Yes, and I but I think they also do because that's partly suspension or disbelief. People will come in and they will say, "How does this work?" Yeah. If they just want to know what the they want to know what the rules are. Whereas in contemporaries, you can assume that everybody knows what the rules are before you break them. Right. So if you're writing contemporary fantasy, obviously there are going to be pillars of normal that you are breaking, but yeah. you can assume that normal is something that is understood. So, I so. I, well, I know because the world building in some ways is to develop context. Character doesn't really exist without context. Exactly. I, to me, that's crucial. Yeah. So yes. So for me, it's about 
context. It's about what they know. But it's like stupid uncrowned king. Do you remember? Because I emailed you and said, Alice, Alice, I need to know about military logistics in a certain time period. Can can you ask Jay? Can are there any books? And then you asked Jay, and you he had a million books about strategy, about tactics, and very, 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 very little about logistics. So then I went to somebody else and I nothing there's, I there's bought, very little about logistics except, yeah, well, I bought a except modern, for the great one by what's his name about alexander the great's army but that's anyway. what i found that's, that's what i that's found. the best that's the best book because it's one of the only ones but because it's one of the only ones and it's exactly it, what it says it is it was right? very controversial when he wrote it oh it's an amazing book people Excellent. were offended at the idea that this brilliant general might be choosing his battles based on logistics it's like Dude, clearly you have never tried to feed your family, never mind 50,000 people, or move yeah. them, or do yeah. anything or else. Move them, or move them. Okay, we are, we are almost asked. done. Any more, are there any more? Oh, what is the logistics book? Hold on, hold on. Alexander the Great and the Logistics of the Macedonian Army, I think, but I could be wrong. The logistics book is Alexander the Great and the Logistics of the Macedonian <laughs> Army by Donald Engels. It is a classic. It's short and it's great. It's fantastic. I think anyone who's writing movements of large movements of people in a <laughs> pre modern setting would do well to read it. You don't I don't have to follow what he did enough. either, but he makes quite clear. Uh, the author does why he thinks certain military targets were chosen so you can kind yeah. of expand out from that I, I was trying to find modern logistics because i figured that would be easier it was worse because apparently that's like a big no-no because logistics can be attacked it's like attacking supply train it's like doing anything else so you're trying to <laughs> you're taking the information in that book and then you're putting it into context. Do you have, how does ma magic work? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you defend with it? Or is it just a nuke? You know, all kinds of questions about what happens on a battlefield when magic is being used about, because some of those things might change the way that the logistics exactly. Could work. Exactly. The, yeah, it's... Not to mention the ecology and the environment and what's available to people and what the terrain is. I mean, there's all these, and these are all, these are all the things that actually interests me about world building because they can actually create plot they absolutely do if you have to actually get around something or if you yeah. have certain things <clears throat> or they create extremely inconvenient plot because you know you weren't actually thinking about the fact that you would try to be taking an army down where and how are you going to feed them and all of a sudden you are <laughs> yeah all of a sudden does it work or not do we have to get over caradris and it's snowing oh no <gasps> My favorite. Yes, the things that you uh, foolishly didn't consider, now you're stuck with. Because that's you're stuck thing. with. Well, the world building makes it consistent. I think that's the yeah. really big and important thing. If you do the world building, then it you have something consistent so that you're not yeah. bouncing around or changing rules at your own convenience. Because the minute you start to do that, it kills any suspension of disbelief. And it kills the investment in paying attention to details. Because clearly, if you're just doing this obviously off the cuff, the details don't matter. I think that's a I I, I think that's a, another incredibly crucial point, and I think it's a great place to leave this conversation. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for joining me at this time, at this fraught time in all our lives. <laughs> um, Again, I want to thank Michelle Sagara. I want to thank CJ, our tech person who's hiding invisibly in the background, keeping an eye on everything for us. Um, next week, I'm going to bring back Fonda Lee because we had those technical difficulties with her November one, and we're going to talk about big books again. Um, and Again, as always, I want to thank SIFWA for providing this platform and the Nebula Conference for providing this platform for me to do this, which I really just do because it's my chance to talk to people <laughs> about <laughs> writing crap. Um, so this is just very selfish. I want to thank all of you who have joined us today. And I want to thank those of you who are watching you uh, watching us on YouTube. And Fonda March, Martha Wells, April, and Saladin Ahmed in May. That's what we're looking for for the rest of this season too. 
thank you again. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me. You should have told them that we once talked about structure for eight solid hours. <laughs> I didn't want to put that in the structure. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, guys.